right. Good morning. Let's get our Bible ready, and we're going to continue our study together. Uh, what a joy it is to be in the presence of God with all of our beloved brothers and sisters. I want to continue on second part of our message titled, The Brightness of the Light. The Brightness of the Light. So um, if you will get your Bible ready, uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground this morning. Um, and let's begin by what we have established last week. Last week, we learned about the supremacy of God and in the fact that God chose to manifest His supremacy by uh, this phenomenon called light. And you would see so many words, so many references about God being the light. And one that we quoted um, last week that we went deeply, uh, we went length and and through uh, is, is this uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 10. And in verse 5, it says that this is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. In Him there's no darkness at all. This is the message that we have heard from Him, uh, Apostle John says, and proclaim to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. In James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every gift, every gift God freely gives us is good and perfect, streaming down from the Father of lights, who shines from the heavens with no hidden shadow or darkness, and is never subject to change. You know, there's so many verses after verses that makes a reference about God uh, being the light of the world, the light of our life. And the book of James so beautifully painted this picture that God is the source and He's the Father of light and He is the kind of light that does not change like a shifting shadow. And if we want to go back into the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2, it was uh, giving a prophecy about um, the future of the people of God. It says the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Of course, this is a prophecy about Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, being the light of the, the world, who shine through the darkness of the world, who pierce through the darkness of death. And we learned last week about knowing God as a light, the characteristic of this light. And I established three things, you know, according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 10, is that first and foremost, this light is also equivalent to the truth. You know, um, as, as is described in this passage. So in other words, we believe that God is light. It means that God is the source and measure of all that is true. God is, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 10, this light is also the truth. We can get to the next slide, please. In other means, you know, in other way to put it is that nothing is truly understood until it is understood in the light of God. You will not fully understand until you fully understand it in the light of God. And the second thing about this light, as the gospel would reveal, is that, you know, this is the truth. This is the light that brings forth joy and hope. You know, if we come to know the truth, not all truth is very easy to bear, but God comes to us in a form of a light that gives uh, give us joy and hope. And He's also the light that gives us clarity. In Him, there's no shadow there's no darkness. There's nothing foreboding darkness. All right? So let's go back to Acts chapter 22. If you will pin your Bible to Acts chapter 22, verse 1 to 11. I'm reading from the ESV version. But let's just read from verse 6. This is Paul's own apologia, Paul's own defense to the Jewish people. Uh, and this is interesting because this is his own word. His own word. Um, and verse 6 says, As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And, I, and he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And then verse 11, 
And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and came into Damascus. Again, as I mentioned to you, this series we're going to cover, we're going to speak about the supremacy of God, about the, um, the fact that God is without compare, about His sovereignty. You know, um, and this is something, uh, a subject that I think even one month is not enough to cover it. But I want to plant this seed in all of us uh, to raise an awareness to kind of remind us again about the nature of the God that we worship. We're not worshiping religion, but we're into relationship with the Most High God. And this God is a supreme God. You know, and, and um, uh, Paul, on his own admission, is the right person to be able to illustrate and teach us about this. Because he encountered himself how God manifests and reveals himself. You know, and, and it's interesting the way he experienced it, as I mentioned last week, because God chose to manifest himself to Paul you know, by ways of light. And what really captured my attention is verse 11 when it says the brightness of that light. The brightness of that light. Because this light is beyond compare. Because it's not the light that comes in the pitch of the black, you know, in darkness. But this is the light that, that outshines even the brightest ray of sun. So the brightest of the bright. And this is the reality. This is the true nature of our God. Uh, in New International Version, verse 11 was translated this way. My companions led me to the hand into Damascus because of the brilliance of the light had blinded me. The brilliance of the light had blinded me. The word brilliant, it, it, it means, you know, it's uh, distinctive. It is very bright. It is distinguished by such brightness. And in fact, the illustration that came up, if you uh, look up in, in Webster Dictionary, is, is likened you know, of a gem of a diamond that is uh, perfectly cut in a particular form with numerous facets, you know, and perfect, and, 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 and its, it's, it's, its shine is beyond compare. So because of the brilliance of the light, I was blinded. At that time when God, you know, uh, uh, revealed himself to Paul, he infiltrated every fiber of his being. Paul was blinded by the brightness reality of who God is. Because of his brilliance, he was blinded. Well, as you would go back in Acts chapter 9 and you would uh, learn the history about Paul and the reality of who he was, you know, uh, you would find out that before he was blinded by this light, he was blinded by so many other things. I could easily say that he was blinded by his own ambition, by his own mission, you know, his own ideology. And I think it is, it is, it is fitting to say that Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22, which is Paul's own recollection of his own personal experience, gives us a, a picture of a showdown between man and God. This is such a contrast showdown between humanity and sovereignty between uh, uh, um, between frailty and supremacy between broken humanity and you know supreme God, and it was so beautifully plotted in the life of Paul, and I I think it will help us understand better if if we explain who he is if we study a little bit who he is, so this is what we can find about who Saul is. So before he was Paul, he was known as Saul, right? And this is what we can find about Saul. Saul was an honorable disciple of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel being one of the most notable, um, most uh, respected um, uh, law uh, uh, Pharisees and even part of the exclusive um, council of Sanhedrin. He's, he's, he's known as the, the, disciple, the, the, the disciple maker or the teacher of the bride of the brightest in, in that time. And you cannot just come to Gamaliel and say, oh, I want to be under your tutelage. You know, um, anyone who come under his mentorship is highly screened, highly uh, um, selected. And Paul managed to be, to, to land in, as part of this um, elite group. So he was one of the honorable disciples of Gamaliel. And according to Talmud, which is the sacred writing of the Jews, the old uh, historical it was said that Gamaliel once complained about one of his impudent 
uh, uh, students who he says that I can never seem to produce enough book for this disciple, for this student. And many scholars believe that uh, Gamaliel was referring to none other than Paul. So Paul was, he was such a bright student as if he was prepared, you know, anyone who's raised in this path, uh, he did not just sign up um, after he graduated from high school, but he was prepared ever since he was old enough to understand to read Torah. He was not only taught how to read, but he was raised in certain ways. And, and he's a distinguished citizen of Rome. He's not just full-blooded Jews on the highest uh, level of the echelon, but he's also a distinguished citizen of Rome. In fact, there was one time when Paul was captured and about to be flogged, he capitalized on this distinguished um, uh, status. He says, don't you know that you were about to flog a Roman citizen? And, you know, they, they freeze. And, you know, the thought of flogging a Roman citizen back in the day was very scary, you know. So he was, uh, by order of religious status up there, and by order of, you know, uh, citizenship, you know, he's also up there. So he's... In, 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 the, in the ladder of society, he's somebody that is very distinguished. And not only that, you know, you can be born with a distinguished status, but authority was given. And Paul is the one that possessed such authority. He was given the authority. He was certified by the highest council to carry about what he wants to carry about, what he has already done uh, at the writing of this, of this message. So before he was Paul, he was Saul. He was the hunter. Of, of all uh, of the ways, the follower of Christ. And he successfully tracked them down, find them, captured them, uh, and, and uh, bring them into the court of, of, of the Pharisees. And many of them ended up dying because of him. So he's all this. And the scripture would tell you Paul is not only that, he, he's such a passionate person. You know, the word passionate, it means easily aroused to anger or somebody that's so explosive in, in passion. And you could easily agree with that if you open in Acts chapter 9, the very first sentence that defined who Paul was. You know, it was said that Paul was still breathing murderous rage. Now, let me, let me read exactly from the word. It's, it says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threat. So he was on fire with such rage against followers of Christ. That's who he was. So he was passionate, but he was also consummate. Uh, it means he's extremely skilled and accomplished. You know, I, I don't know if we can add more to describe who he was, who this guy was. This guy was no Peter or, 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 or James, you know, or Andrew or any, any, any uh, humble fisherman by, that lives on the seashore. This guy is the citizen of Rome, you know, uh, sitting uh, in the inner circle of the elites of the temple, the scholar, noble. Uh, he's, very, he's, he's, he's a great scholar, great thinker, you know, and not only that, he's very passionate, he's very focal, and he's very active of, of what he believes. I don't know if you can find an equivalent of somebody like him in this day and age. Maybe you can, but, you know, whatever it is, that's who he was. So he was one of the epitome of, you know, one who can claim, I have arrived, you know. But yet you would find in the story in Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22, which is what I said earlier, it's the contrast, the showdown between God and man. You would find that even Paul falls short of the glory of God. You know, the book of Rome, the very book that Paul also wrote, described the reality of the brokenness of humanity, he says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I'd like to think that he was able to pen it very beautifully because he experienced it firsthand, how even the best of him still won't mount up to God. How many of you understand that? I think it's, it's necessary for us to repeat that again and again and again because how we approach our faith these days is that as if we're trying to score some points with God. It's as if everything depends on us and not depends on the finality of Christ's work at the cross. You know, well, it's true. We have to, you know, the fruit of 
Our love to God is a life that is changed, a priority that's changed, values that are changed. But the way the world would approach it this day, it's backward. We try to have the image first and then develop the passion. The Bible would teach us differently. He would want us to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul. He would want us to have a relationship with Him first. And then everything else, you know, will come to place. And I think it is very important, especially in a very highly scholastic environment and society, very progressive in this city, in this day and age, that we establish this. That, you know, in the end, it's about simplicity of our faith to the supremacy of God. Nothing more, nothing less. You know, just going back to that simplicity, you know, and we need to hear this, we need to see this, and we need to be reminded that God is supreme above all. Amen? So that is who Saul is. And, you know, the best of him won't even cut it to God. And, and you could easily see the comparison so true as illustrated in the book, in, in the writing of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 would say, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like polluted garment. We all fade like leaf, and our iniquities like the wind that take us away. Other translations would say all of us have been sinful. Even our best actions are filthy through and through. Whoa. Filthy through and through. And you know that this book, Isaiah, was speaking from a, a, a context that is understood uh, for um, uh, Jewish people in that day because, you know, you know how every Sabbath they are to cleanse themselves, they are to keep their garment pure, they are not to touch carcasses, they are not to do things that are, you know, uh, that they have been told they're not supposed to do, so they are to keep their garment clean. But Isaiah is teaching them that even the best that we can do still won't cut it to God. If it had not been because of Him paying the price for us, when Jesus died on the cross for us, he paid the ransom, the price for that, the price that we can never pay by our own righteousness. The message translation says, we all are sin infected and sin contaminated. Our best efforts are grease stained rags. You know, we may look at ourselves, we may dress ourselves, fashion ourselves with the best that this world has to offer. Best education, best clothing, best car, best lifestyle. But without godliness, without the, the redemptive, the grace and mercy of God, you know, it's what it is. Grease stained rags. Not even a rope, it's a rags. You know, the Indonesian got it right. Kain pal. You know. New King James Version says, We all are like unclean things, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all are infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. And it was so vividly and beautifully illustrated in the showdown in Acts chapter 9 that was retold by Paul's own admission in Acts chapter 22. You know, the fact that Paul, one who who arrived in such a you know, position in, in his, the standard of his society, but when he came face to face with God, Paul, who was said to be raised since early age, to know God, to serve God, to know his word. But even then, when God revealed himself to Paul, Paul Saul was, Saul says that his first reaction was, Who are you, God? Who are you, God? Because he was blinded by his own knowledge. He was blinded by his own ambition. He was blinded by his own depiction of who God is, according to his own standard. But when through God revealed himself, it was clear to him that it was foreign. He was foreign to him. That even, Paul, even Saul says, who are you, God? So that's who he was. Now, the other spectrum of the of this exchange is the reality of God, the supremacy of God. We've, we've seen how Paul is. And I think it's best to also reveal who God is from Paul's own admission as well. Because after all, he's the one who experienced what it's like to 
encounter God face to face. So let's turn to the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20. This is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to verse 20. And I like it because the passage is titled, The Preeminence of Christ. The Preeminence of Christ. This is what it says in ESV. Verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers, Or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. Listen to this. All things were created by Him, through Him, and for Him. So He he did not only create the universe, but He sustained the universe. Verse Verse 18, and He is the head. Sorry, verse 17, and He is before all things. And in Him, all things hold together. He holds all things together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in everything, He might be preeminent. That's the word. That He might be preeminent. For in Him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through Him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his Christ. I want to encourage you to pin this word. If you have a, a physical Bible, you know, just you know, put something like a bookmark or something. If you're using a smartphone, you know, highlight first 15 to 20 and mark it. And I want to encourage you through this week and through this month to meditate on this. Read it again. I don't know how many times I've read this, you know, but... This is such a gem. This is such a revelation. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to enhance its meaning personally to you so that you would get a shed of, you know, the awesome wonder of our God, His preeminence. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. So all things were created by Him, through Him, and for Him. And verse 17, He is before all things. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So He didn't just create all things. He sustained them. He sustained them. In case you're wondering why the universe is a cosmos instead of a chaos, it's because He holds it together. He holds all the orbits of all the interplanetary... uh, you know, system, he holds it together. Why the sun would rise, you know, in the east and sets on the west. And, you know, at such times, why seasons would come and seasons would go. Kings would be enthroned and then dethroned. Why a system comes into being? Because there is this invisible supreme God that in his supremacy holds all things together. It's not because of a happenstance or a natural process of elimination. But behind it, it is God and God alone. And He is the head of the body and the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth in heaven, Making peace by the blood of his of his cross, all right. So let's let's go with the the background context of this passage because the more we understand the background behind the writing, the more you will appreciate what it means. So at the writing of this text, Paul was in his first um, uh, incarceration. So it's around AD sixty to sixty one. You know, it's during his first imprisonment in Rome. He was under house arrest when he received news about the state of um, the church in Colossae. So he received news from Epaphras, one of the elders of, of, of that, that city church. And despite all the good news about the fate of the people and how the church was growing, at the same time there was also bad news. Paul received a report that they were also struggling 
with a heresy, a Christological heresy. A, a heresy is, is a teaching that is corrupted, you know. So Paul was actually addressing a heresy. Paul was addressing a heresy. And the heresy that is going on in the church of Colossus was the fact that there were false teachers who were teaching erroneous doctrine about Christ. And they preached that Christ was prominent but not preeminent. So he was prominent but not preeminent. I, I, English is not my first language so I still have to look up on all of this. So the word prominent, it means one that stands out or projecting beyond the surface or line. So one among many standing out, you know, but you know, there are many alternatives. It's uh, something that's noticeable. So it's one among many. But then again, the word preeminent, it gives you an understanding, having a paramount rank, a dignity or importance. It's supreme. The word preeminence gives you an understanding. It's the quality or state of being superior. Highest in rank or authority, highest in degree or quality. It's the ultimate. And ultimate, it means the last in progression. There's nothing else. You know, it's the perfect version. The best or the most extreme of its kind. The original, the basic, the fundamental, but also the last of its kind. The last version, which is the perfect version. You know, uh, in, uh, incapable of further analysis. That's the word preeminent. So, this false teacher introduced a heresy that says that Christ was not preeminent. He was just prominent. The way that they do that is that this false teacher claiming that Jesus was none other that, that in, that, than one of the angelic manifestation of God. You know, he's, he's divine, if you would say it in this word. He's one of the divine manifestation, but he's not God. You know, well, you can be an angel and be divine. You can be human and be divine, but still, that would place you in the rank that you're not God. But that is so unlike the truth about who he is. So, what happens in the process, you know, is that because whenever there is a heresy, it opens the door to so many other ism, so many other deception. So, what happens is it's not trying to uh, um, deny, but it's trying to corrupt the truth. I mean, this is true of all, you know, uh, heresy that happens even to this day. The devil's strategy has always been that. So, in the process, you know, there's so many other uh, teachings, so many other false beliefs. And as a result, ultimately it denied both the deity and the sufficiency and the deity and the humanity of God. See, this is, this is what's, what's, what, what's different about our God. He's 100% God, but he chose to, the word become flesh and walk among us, you know. So this error opens the door to so many confusion about the gospel, about the church, and about Christian life. And uh, false beliefs begin to infiltrate the church. And this error was presented as a substitute of the concept of Christ, of the faith of Christ. So the worst is that they were not presented to refute the idea of God or Christ. But they were presented alongside Christ. And as a result, it gives you an impression that Christ is not enough. Isn't that sounds familiar to this day? Uh, you know, Christ is not enough. Yeah, you need to do this and this and this and that. You need to be this and this and that, you know. You know, um, I'm not saying that after you receive Christ, you should not do anything else. But all the action that result from the point of receiving Christ should be the fruit of your conversion, of your transformation, because you love Christ. Now, the word would teach you, do it first, then being first. You know, so this is, this is what happens. And, and as a result, Paul was, was moved to write a refutal, a rebuttal, and, and this, this letter. Uh, and and his, re, his, 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 his response was this letter, to exalt the supremacy and the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love his approach because the way Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1, in the book of Colossians, you read the whole, the whole uh, passage. It's a, it's a very short book. Is that Paul did not begin by refuting or attacking the error. 
but he begin by declaration of truth. You know, it, 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 it really blesses me because so many times we try so much to attack the wrong. We try to attack the error. You know what? If we would just go back to the word of God and declare the word of God. If you remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. You know, Paul's approach, I think, is an approach that we can use in our time, in our day and uh, our season. Is that, you know, instead of focusing so much, I'm, we, sh- we should be aware of the error. But you know what? The way Paul defeats the error is by declaring the truth even louder. Focusing and giving the platform, writing about it, teaching about it, and sharing the truth. Church, Because the truth is, just like Jesus says, the reality of our life in this world until he comes is that the bad seed will grow alongside the good seed. And it will be allowed to grow until the day of harvest. Anybody hear about this? Amen? Remember about the parable that Jesus says, you know, uh, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a farmer uh, uh, who sow good seed, but at night the enemy comes and sow the weeds. And then the workers say, Lord, we, we have to uproot all the, the weeds. And Jesus said, no, no, no. If you uproot the weeds, you know, the, the good seed will also be uprooted. So he says, let it grow until the day of harvest. And then comes harvest, we can easily distinguish. You know, that's the reality. You know, there will always be error. But as for you and I, our focus is the truth. We must spend more energy on focusing on the truth. We must spend more energy on speaking the truth, declaring the truth. Actuating the truth, spreading the truth, and banking on the truth rather than being nervous and be afraid of the, of the error. You know, I like what one pastor, H.B. Charles Jr. says. He says, in this text, Paul presents to us the most essential truth of the historic Christian faith. That Christianity is Christ and Christ is God. Christianity is Christ and Christ is God. This passage teaches us about the preeminence, the supremacy of God on Paul's own admission. And who better qualified to say this than a person who has been face to face and encounter when God manifests himself, the supreme God manifests himself before the broken man. You know, and because of this passage, Thank God, because of this passage, we now as a believer, you know, we can confidently live, we can confidently minister and witness with unwavering confidence on the supremacy of God, that the God that we serve is indeed the God of the whole universe. He is a supreme God. He stands above any other things. There is no contest you know, just give him the trophy, give him the belt. You know, there's not even, you know, not even, it's not even, there's not even going to be a fight worth mentioning when it comes to God. As for the Lord, he stand tall on his own. He's supreme, you know. And I want to share with you two things based on Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20, why we can have this unwavering confidence on the supremacy of Christ. Number one is that in, in, in verse 15 to 17, we will learn that Jesus Christ is supreme over all creation. Jesus Christ is supreme over all creation. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things in him. All things hold together. All things hold together. My, my God, if you are trying to live your life, you're trying to live your best life without God, you know, you could even barely hold your family together. You, you, you could even barely hold your schedule together. And you want to try to solve the mystery of life? My friend, can I humbly suggest to you, you need God. You need Christ. You need Him. He's supreme over all creation, including your broken life including your challenges, including your hang-ups, your setback, your failure, your everything. Let Him hold it for you. If He would be your God, if you would allow Him to be supreme over your life, well, you know what? It's not that He needs your permission. He's supreme no matter what. But if you would allow Him to rule also over your life, 
you know, I promise you that, you know, orders instead of chaos will be your life. And many people would like to understand that when you say order, it means that there will not be any sorrow. No. God, godly order, God's order, is beyond our estimation and value. God can even turn sorrow into joy. But if we live without Him, then sorrow is the end of our life. But as for God, what the devil meant for evil, he can turn it around for good. He holds all things together. Even the bad things that the enemy is launching at you, he can turn it around for good. Number one, Jesus Christ is supreme over all creation. Number two, Jesus Christ is supreme over the church. Jesus Christ is supreme over the church. He is the head, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in everything, he might be preeminent. He might be preeminent. He's the head over the body. You know, I mean, I don't care how good, how beautiful, how well-formed, how well-built, how muscular, how perfectly shaped or toned a body is. But without a head, you're dead. You're dead. You know, and the only thing that it matters in a body is that you have a good head. You know, back in the day, they used to define clinically dead by the pulse on your heart. But these days, whenever the brain stops sending signal through your, you know, uh, what, do, what do you call the stem right there, you're clinically dead. Even though you're still breathing, your heart is still beating. You know, disconnected from the head. Even though neck is still attached to your shoulder, but disconnected. He is the head of the body and the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Preeminent, it means paramount. Dignit, rank, paramount in rank and in dignity, importance. The quality of being superior, highest in the rank of authority, final, ultimate, no other upgrade, the last series, the last progression. Basic, fundamental, original, incapable of further analysis or upgrade. That's who he is. That's who you are. You know. And, and we love to sing that song, you know. He's a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. I wish you would also add that he's supreme. He's, he's unchanging by the world. He's, he's, he's unaffected. By anything in the world, if ever he's the one that affect the world. I mean, come on, church. I pray that our faith will rise. We're not just worshiping, you know, uh, a God that is prominent. But he is preeminent. He's not just one among many. But he's the one. You know, <laughs> let me close with this mental picture. You know, if you go to uh, New York, I don't know if it's still there. But if you, if you, if you... Uh, not, not the city, but the statue. Uh, in front of Rockefeller Center, there was this uh, statue of a Greek mythology called Atlas. And, you, I mean, you know, after this, you can Google it. Some of you are Googling it right now. So Atlas, you know, it's like the big muscular god who is holding that globe, the world, right? Oh, with all the muscles, stretching his muscles. Oh, you know. Right? Opposite of the Rockefeller Center is St. Patrick Cathedral, St. Patrick Church. And if you ever enter that cathedral, you go inside the sanctuary. Behind the pulpit, there is a small statue of little boy Jesus holding the globe. <laughs> like this. You know, they should have put it not behind the altar. They should put it up, up front. You know, it's like, what's up, Atlas? Tired yet? <laughs> what's up, bro? Need help? He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Are you tired yet trying to help everything in your life together? Maybe because you're trying on your own. If you would just confess to him and allow his supremacy, you know, he's supreme no matter what, you know. But it would be nice for you, you know, as a reference, you know, gesture to say, Lord, you can... You can just barge in into my life. You're God. But instead, we have the kind of God that says, look, I'm standing in front of the door and knock. If 
you would open the door, I will come in and dwell with you. The God of the whole universe, the God who is preeminent above everything, the God, you know, who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and of authorities. All things were created through him and for him and is before all things and in him all things together. That God want to make his domain in you. I say that's such a great revelation. Amen? Come on, church. I want to encourage you this morning. Maybe you were saying, yeah, but there are so many things that I have questioned about God. Hey, join the club. This is the club about discovering more about God. None of us here profess to know, oh, let me tell you about God. I'm not here standing and speaking to you, though I address with you every week, but I'm not doing so on the standpoint of, let me teach you, let me school you about God. No, we're all growing in this. We're all growing in this. I want to encourage you this morning, open your heart. And then, you know, maybe we're like Paul. Many of us, were blinded by our own ambition. We're blinded by our own, you know, self-sufficiency. We thought we have it all figured out. We thought we have it all accomplished. Some of you, the young people, you thought you never die. You know, I mean, you drive like there's no, you know, heaven and hell. They say there are two types of driver when you look from the Christology point of view. Resurrection driver, or <laughs> let me not continue. Okay, but whatever it is, let me tell you something. You have a limit. You have limit. And I humbly appeal to you: Would you open your life to God? Would you allow the God that is without limit to come into your life? To, you know. Let him hold everything together in your life. Let him piece all those, all those pieces together in your life. And I promise you, you're going to experience a life that is so fulfilling. You're going to experience God manifesting his promise, his good promise in you, through you. Amen? I pray this morning that you would come to understand that the God that we worship that Christ is supreme over all creation. He's supreme over the church. He's God, period. Christianity is Christ, and Christ is God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. I pray, Lord, that faith will arise from within this place and not faith on ourselves, not faith on the system, not faith on our own perfectly little plan, not perfect on our own ability, not faith on our asset, on our portfolio, on our deposit, on our accomplishment. But I pray, Lord, this morning, oh God, that every heart will turn to you, that every heart will be open to you and you alone, oh God. I pray this morning, oh God, that everyone will come to you and say, Lord, you can have my heart. Lord, you can have my heart. Lord, you can have my heart. Father, I pray this morning that Christ be glorified in this place, in our life, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of our Father. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you begin to work in the heart of man, that you will drive them back to God. I pray, oh God, that you will heal all the pain, all the rejection, all the disappointment, all the hang-ups and setback. Things that they have experienced that cause them, oh God, to doubt about you. Every hurts, even from Christians, even from ministers. Lord, help us to encounter Jesus Christ. You are not only supreme, but you are also sufficient for us. You are all that we need, Lord. You are all that we need. 
the world would say, all you need is love. Well, that's half true. It depends on how you define love. But we all know that the Bible says that God is love. So all you need is God. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, continue to speak. Lead your church into a place of encounter the same way Paul in his pride, in his accomplishment, encountered the greatness of God. At that moment, he was broken severely, but he was broken from his own failing humanity. And as a result, he was being gloriously transformed by the goodness of God. So I pray, Lord, that the same would happen to so many of us in this place, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will guide us, oh God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Waymaker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Come on, would you help me declare in this place? Waymaker, miracle work, promise keep, Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are, Lord. Waymaker, miracle work, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 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 Even though I don't see it, you work. Even though I can feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even though I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never Lord. Stop. You, never you stop hold working. everything together. You never stop. You never Come stop on, let's working. confess this. Even, Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop. Come on, say it one last time. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Come on, shout it out. Waymaker, miracle worker. Waymaker, miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 That's who you are, Lord. You are all that and even more. Even so much more. Thank you, Lord. For those of us who say yes to you, this is going to be the beginning of such an exciting journey of learning, knowing, and countering your preeminence, your supremacy over our lives. We thank you, Lord. We welcome you. Holy Spirit, work in our heart, in our mind, in our thoughts. Manifest through our deeds. Infiltrate our life. Let the declaration of your truth defeat, eradicate, silence all those erroneous beliefs that has been piling up within our heart, within our mind.
things that has been passed on to us, imposed upon us, taught upon us, oh God, or things that we have learned upon ourselves in our own self-attempt of holding things together in our life. Holy Spirit, infiltrate our life, our heart, our mind, our spirit. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.